Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and welcome to Broadway Buzz, and welcome to Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations. Uh, from the mid-1960s through the 70s, the Temptations really skyrocketed in their success. Uh, they literally went from being kids who lived in the projects without any education at all, suddenly they would become international celebrities. They would sell tens of millions of records. They would create 50 albums. Uh, 42 of them would go into the top 10 hits. And of that list of 42, 14 of them would go to number one. Uh, Billboard magazine would call them the greatest rhythm and blues group ever. And it, of course, was true. Uh, one of the things that's so fascinating about this production that you're going to see, uh, you're going to see this group reach extreme stardom uh, and success at every level, money, cars, women, but then there were drugs, alcohol, and there's a dark side to this story. So, you know, while the group was constantly moving up, there was a group of five singers, each of them unique in their own right, and each of them a kind of superstar in their own way. Uh, but what would happen to many of the members of the group, three to be specific, uh, would be seduced by drugs, alcohol, one ultimately by suicide. So the tragedy is we're seeing two things happening at once. Inordinate success, fame, wealth, but then on the other hand, this internal issue of egos, problems, dysfunction, uh, and the fall of several of these brilliant talents. It's a wonderful story, beautifully told, uh, and you're going to be seeing it in a magnificent production. Okay, let me begin by talking about Barry Gordy. Many of you know that Barry Gordy was one of the great black impresarios uh, in the music industry. He would create Motown Records. His base was Detroit, therefore Motortown. Uh, his family gave him $800, and he made a down payment on a little house. He put a huge sign out on the front lawn that said, Hitsville, USA. So even before they were really Motown and known around the world, uh, he gave them their banner headline. And in that simple little house, in the basement of the house, uh, he had a recording studio. He had the greatest musicians from the Detroit area working for him. They would record 22 hours a day. Uh, in the main part of the house, uh, he would have offices that were dedicated to training his young talent. Barry Gordy had this extraordinary eye for talent. Keep in mind, he would discover the miracles, the temptations, uh, the, uh, the Supremes, uh, the Jackson Five, uh, and then individuals like Diana Ross uh, and Stevie Wonder. I mean, it was amazing uh, his ability to spot talent, not only to spot it, but learn how to develop it and hone it and shape it. He always said for years, uh, he worked in the Ford Motor Plant, and he understood the importance of quality control and so that's what he did. He'll be a central character in the show you see tonight and watch how that character supervises the temptations, not only from the time that they were beginning when he was helping to define and invent them, but all through their career when, keep in mind, music changes very quickly, and so they had to keep up with what the most contemporary kind of music was, what the sound should be, uh, how to keep it current, potent, uh, important to keep it at the, the top of the heap. Uh, and Barry Gordon was a master. And he had multiple groups he was doing this with. Watch a beautiful scene near the end of the first act where you see the Supremes on stage uh, uh, doing a television show, and at the same time, we see the Temptations, two of his Supreme groups uh, ultimately coming together in a way, and you can see how brilliantly he was able to hone and shape their particular talents. Uh, one of the things that was remarkable about Barry Gordy, especially in that little house at Hitsville, USA, is he would take these kids, once he sort of took them on as clients, 
but then he would shape and hone them. So he would have a person in charge of deportment. And this is very like the way the old movie studios worked. Uh, he would teach them how to speak, how to dress, how to do makeup, how to wear their hair, how to conduct a proper interview, uh, all of the necessary things that are associated with fame. <clears throat> and then he would have vocal coaches who would help each group find their sound. And they would work very carefully with harmonics uh, to get just the right unique sound for that group. Uh, so again, you know, when you see, have the opportunity of seeing the Supremes uh, and the Temptations on the stage at the same time near the end of the first act, you will see, you know, how brilliant he was at giving them unique sounds, unique impressions, uh, unique music that they presented. Uh, everything was part of what he did. Uh, also then, uh, he, these groups, once they were hired, uh, would be given new material almost every week that they would record. So the recording studio functioned 22 hours a day, and people were called in at 4 a.m. to do a recording. Uh, at the end of the week on Friday, Barry Gordy would listen to these recordings uh, with a group of trusted colleagues, and they would pick the best um, you know, the best uh, album of the week or the best song of the week and develop it. So all of his groups were always in competition with one another. The other thing he did, because these groups were young and really didn't have a lot of performance experience, so again, he would send them out on buses, on tours, and he called it the Motor Town Tour. Mostly they went south of the Mason-Dixon line. Mostly they played... Uh, to black audiences in black clubs in the South, but what better audience to use? Because of course, uh, the black audience was so much more sophisticated about rhythm and blues and the trending new music, the Motown music, than the white audience was. So he could hone their performance skills in that way. He would send uh, coaches with them on the bus uh, who would give notes, production notes, etc. cetera. Uh, so they were really, beautifully, powerfully trained. The other thing I want you to notice when you watch the show tonight is that Barry Gordy doesn't really leave them the moment they become stars. He literally stays with them and controls everything they do, what their image is, what their new music will be, uh, how they change with the times, how the clothes will change with the time, how the act will change with the changing times in music. So Barry Gordy is an extraordinary man. Uh, and uh, he's wonderfully presented in this show. Okay, so let me introduce you then to the Temptations. There were five original famous Temptations, and that's what this musical focuses on. The founder of the group is Otis Williams. Otis Williams was born in a tiny town in Texas. Uh, his mother was very poor. His father left the family. And so his mother left him with his grandmother while he moved, while she moved to Detroit to work in the factories to make money so she could bring her son to live with her. Uh, so in his early childhood, uh, Otis Williams was very strongly exposed to music that he heard in church, so gospel music great black gospel music. And this gave him his love of harmony, his love of music. Keep in mind, young kids at this time, especially young black kids, this is a period of mid-1950s, uh, this was a very, very difficult time. There was very extreme segregation that still existed in America. And so kids could get out of the ghetto by an education, but that was very difficult and expensive. Two, they could get out through sports. And three, they could get out through music. So Otis Williams decided very early on that music was going to be his key, his passport to the rest of the world. And it worked brilliantly. He, he created a number of groups. He always used five singers. Uh, when he joined his mother in Detroit, and as a young teenager, uh, he used to gather together kids from school or kids from church, and they would literally sing under street lamps for tips, uh, or they would go to, you know, proms or rock hops uh, and uh, perform for very little money, but at least he was trying to develop a group. He would find a young boy in school 
who would stay with him through all of the high point of the career of the Temptations. Uh, his name was Melvin Franklin. Melvin Franklin had this unique bass voice. Uh, later, when they would become a great success, critics all over the world would say this was one of the greatest bass singers in any group performing in the world. But Otis would find him. There's a wonderful, charming story. Watch the little vignette. Uh, when you see how he gets him to join the group. He uh, literally has to beg uh, Melvin's mother for permission. Again, keep in mind, parents were very strict in this period, not wanting their kids out to be exposed to gangs or drugs or uh, all of these dark things that were happening on the street. So it's a wonderful little vignette you see. One of the things that makes this musical so unique that I love so much about it is we literally see the temptations being born in front of our eyes. Not only do we see it, we hear it. So at the beginning, we have two of these great voices that will stay with the group through the entire period. These two men uh, will be the sort of glue, they will be the cement to keep the group together. The other three who will join uh, will bring not only enormous talent, but also enormous problems to the group. Okay, so the next two to join the group would be Paul Williams, no relation, but Paul Williams was a kind of front singer, meaning that in a group of five, he would be the one doing many of the solo numbers uh, at that point. But also he brought to the group a tremendous sophistication because he understood the power of choreography and he understood the need to create really cool moves for the group, which he did. And then also he helped to dress them. He was the one who gave them their famous purple suits. I would kill to have one of those purple suits <laughs> in any case, <clears throat> in any case. So we, the other person who would join with him then uh, is Eddie Kendrick. Uh, sometimes he called himself Eddie Kendrick, and sometimes he added an S to the end of his name and called himself Eddie Kendricks. So during the run of The Temptations, you will see variations in that. People have tried to correct me, but literally he used at various times Kendrick, Kendricks with an S. Okay, so, but what Eddie Kendricks brought to this group that was extraordinary was he had an incredible falsetto. And in the same way uh, that Melvin had this brilliant bottom sound, we now have uh, Eddie Kendricks, who has this incredible top sound. And again, so many of the songs that The Temptation sang are really built on this harmony and built on this you know, juxtaposition of top note, bottom note. And it gives you goosebumps uh, when you hear it. So now we have four of the members together. It's at this point, uh, and the fifth member, I won't confuse you because there were so many people coming and going, but the fifth member of note who stayed with him the longest time was a milkman who was married and had a, a, a young baby. And so <clears throat> at one point, uh, he dropped out of the group saying, you know, I really have to support my family. And right after that, of course, they skyrocketed to great success. So you can imagine the thoughts he must have had uh, by leaving that group. But in any case, when they, there was a group of five, but the four great voices are now together. We're about a third of the way through the first act of the musical you're going to be seeing. Barry Gordy takes them on and they become a part of Motown. Uh, and therefore they're put in that system of being educated, trained, uh, they record every week. In the first several years, uh, they never had a hit song. So they were called the hitless temptations. But magic would happen. They would find a new fifth member, David Ruffin, who would transform everything. David Ruffin was an electric performer. I mean, uh, he, he would sing and mesmerize the audience. He would leap in the air and do a complete split, throwing his microphone in the air and catching it just at the moment he had to sing the money note. Uh, so, you know, the audiences went crazy for David Ruffin. So now the group is complete. <clears throat> uh, actually, one of the writers at the time who was working at Hitsville, Smokey Robinson, famous in his own right, uh, as a performer and member of a group, but a brilliant songwriter who would write a lot of the early music for The Temptations. When he met David Ruffin and heard the sound that they had, 
Keep in mind, he would replace Paul Williams as the front man, so obviously there's internal problems there with that. Okay, but in any case, Smokey Robinson writes a song for them that would transform their lives and turn them into international celebrities. It was called My Girl. So watch that scene the first time they present My Girl about a third of the way through the first act. <clears throat> and that's when you're electrified because that's when you know the rest of the evening is going to be about this incredible sound with these incredible artists who work so brilliantly together on stage. Okay, so that gives you the sense of the temptations. In real life, what would happen is there would be internal problems. Uh, uh, the group would separate people. Three of the group would come and go at various times. Uh, at one point, when they were performing in Cleveland, actually, uh, at the Versailles, uh, uh, David Ruffin did not appear, and they fired him. Uh, while they were in Cleveland, actually. So he came and went several times with the group, as you will see. But the story is brilliantly told. Okay, so let us look at how this musical was created. Let me start by reminding you of the genre of this kind of musical. It's called jukebox musical, meaning that music comes from an outside source. It's music from a group, music from a solo singer, uh, but in some way then they do a musical biography on stage of the person like Tina Turner, like Donna Summer, uh, like MJ, Michael Jackson, the show that's playing in New York right now, or they, they glorify groups like the Four Seasons. Uh, and so this is the standard way we see jukebox musicals. But I want you to know it's a very eclectic kind of musical form because sometimes uh, they've taken the music from a group like ABBA and they turned it into a story totally unrelated to ABBA called Mamma Mia. And Mamma Mia, of course, was one of the greatest jukebox musicals ever, followed by Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, uh, and most recently, Girl from the North Country, which is the music of Dylan. I saw that in London uh, right before the pandemic. I saw it three times. I couldn't stay away from it. Uh, and it, it, it sort of brought to life Dylan's music in a way that even he, in his concerts, couldn't bring it to life. It's an extraordinary tale. Again, taking his music but telling a story totally unrelated to Dylan, it's a story about people in America, in Minnesota, uh, after the great crash. Uh, and uh, it, it's very compelling and riveting, and the music is so perfectly suited for the story we see on stage. So the jukebox musical is a very rich source. The other thing I want you to know is that New York critics especially do not like jukebox musicals, and they have a tendency of attacking them, especially Jesse Green, who is the leading uh, drama critic for the New York Times. Uh, he is the son of Betty Comden and Adolph Green, two of the great composer lyricists of the golden age of the musical theater. But for some reason, he's been intolerable in his hatred for jukebox musicals. I, in turn, have written him poison pen letters for years, <laughs> and I write them in red ink, and he doesn't even answer me. Uh, but in any case, I keep reminding him his premise is totally wrong. Keep in mind, when Rodgers and Hammerstein created the formula for the Oklahoma musical, they said, you have to find a storyline from another source. And so they, when they wrote uh, Oklahoma, based their story on Green Grow the Lilacs, and they turned it into that brilliant libretto for Oklahoma. So Jesse Green has no problem with storylines being taken from another source, play, novel, film script. He has no problem with that, but he has tremendous problem with taking music from another source and doing the same thing. Uh, you know, he doesn't have much to stand on in, in that regard. I'll continue writing those letters, I promise. Okay, but I do have to tell you, he did love this show, so there we go. Okay, so in any case then, let us look at the artists who created this brilliant work. We start with Des McEnough, the director of the show. He goes back to 1975 when he took the Who's Tommy, a concept album, and staged it in the most outrageous way. It was a brilliant production, but it was sort of the beginning of jukebox musicals really being taken seriously on Broadway. 
Des McEnough would then do Jersey Boys. He would collaborate with Sergio Trajillo, who is the great choreographer. They work together in this show. In this show, Sergio Trajillo will win a Tony Award for the outstanding choreography you're going to see. When you see the choreography, you'll understand why. Okay, so, but Des McEnough is the perfect choice as director, not only because he's had this long history, he's also a musician, but he's had this long history of working with jukebox musicals and developing the best of the best of jukebox musicals. But Des McEnough also served for years at the La Jolla Playhouse uh, in California, in La Jolla. And uh, I, I would go once a year to see his work there because it was always so groundbreaking and outstanding. Many of his shows over that period <coughs> ultimately moved to New York. So in that way, he's extremely gifted because unlike most New York directors, you know, he's directed many, many, many shows professionally. I mean, when you work in a regional theater like La Jolla, you do six or eight shows a year, and he was there over 20 years, so you build up a lot of important shows in that period. But also Des McEnough was the artistic director at Stratford, Ontario, which is the greatest classical acting company in the Western Hemisphere, and he directed uh, uh, you know, all the great uh, tragedies, Shakespeare's tragedies, and why that's important is when we see these figures in the story, these five characters uh, are like tragic heroes. Uh, they reach great success, and the higher they go, the bigger the fall. That's always the premise that Shakespeare used in tragedy. I mean, when we talk about King Lear, he wasn't just a father who had dementia, he was the king of the greatest empire in the world with dementia. Uh, and so it takes on a totally different proportion. And so that will work very well for Des McEnough to bring to life these five figures, these five men uh, that we will fall in love with through the course of this show. Uh, in terms then of Sergio Trujillo, when we think about these groups, when they performed, especially in the 60s and 70s, they performed in small nightclubs usually. And so they would play very far downstage and sing directly to the audience. Uh, but there would be some movement. Usually it was in two parallel lines, four backup singers, one solo singer, three uh, doing some harmonies and two doing a counter harmony. And then they'd switch and keep moving. But everything was done in parallel lines. Watch for that in Sergio Trujillo's choreography but watch how he's able to explode that and fill the whole stage. Especially watch in the second act, uh, they go on a world tour. And when they play in Paris, they set the idea that the audience is stage right. And all of the theatrical lights are coming from there on these figures. It's like we're watching it from the wings. When they go to London, the audience is meant to be up there and they are playing with their full backs to us. Uh, but again, it's as though we're stagehands sitting in the rigging watching choreography from a way we never get to see it from behind. So Sergio Trujillo is a master, and everything he does is evocative, provocative, and makes the music explode in the best way. When Otis Williams uh, came to see the rehearsals of this show before it opened in New York, he said to Sergio Trujillo, why didn't we have you when we were working? Because, I mean, the choreography is so spectacular. Okay, and so now I want to introduce Dominique Morisot, who wrote the book of this musical. There's a lot of information to go on. Otis Williams did write an autobiography. It's a very polite autobiography, and it doesn't really tell us enough of the grit that we really need to know to understand what happened to the Temptations. But there is a wonderful book that does that. It's called Ain't Too Proud to Beg, and it really goes into the rise and fall of each of the members uh, of The Temptations. There was also a wonderful television series called The Temptations, which was a four-part Emmy Award-winning series. You can easily find it on YouTube, uh, and it's easily available. So uh, Dominique Morisot had a lot of material to work with when she wrote the storyline for the musical you're seeing, but there are a couple things I want you to know about her. She was born in Detroit. Uh, she is an African-American playwright of great distinction. Uh, she wrote a trilogy called Detroit Project, which is literally about 
black families uh, who have really lost their ability to make, an in, uh, make, a, make money, to have a life because their, their professions have been taken away from them. As we know, in many cities, industry is lost. This, of course, happened in Cleveland, especially in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> and so she's able to write about this with great authority. The other thing is, she brings in very strongly, remember the time frame of the temptations, 60s, early 70s. This is the period of great civil unrest. This is the period of all of the riots that happened in Detroit, Los Angeles, Cleveland, in the Huff riots. So this was a very tempestuous time. Uh, and it was, it's wonderfully developed in the show. Okay, uh, so you're in for a great treat. You're in, you're in the hands of masters telling the story about a great and memorable group, and it's told in a very compelling and original way. Uh, staging is spectacular. Okay, uh, I want to take a moment, something I never do, but I want to talk about, uh, one, the music of The Temptations, how it would influence a particular group of people. Uh, I want to focus on the Huff Riots in Cleveland, which happened in 1966. Okay, so I was a young theater director at the time, uh, and the Huff Riots happened, and as those of you old enough to remember realize what a horror it was, it was like a war zone. I mean, families had their houses burned down, uh, the tenements where they lived were burned down, schools were burned, playgrounds were destroyed. These poor kids who lived in the Huff area were literally living in a war zone. <clears throat> so uh, the, the mayor of Cleveland at the time, uh, uh, called me and said, you know, would, could you put together some kind of program to get these poor kids off the street? We're talking about, you know, a, a thousand kids. And so happily, the Cleveland Playhouse was in residence at Chautauqua, New York, for the summer, so that whole building was available, and I talked them into giving it to us. We had a thousand kids a day, uh, you know, come, and Mayor Stokes came to greet them all. He, as you remember, was the first great black mayor of an American city, very charismatic, uh, and very insightful to be developing this program. But when I worked on this program, I, I realized the kids were damaged and they needed some way to sort of vent what happened to them. So we all decided that we were going to do a little musical that we would call the Inner City Cinderella. And the little girl we cast as Cinderella uh, had, uh, had one great skill. Uh, she could dance on the tips of her toes. And I said to every, every kid, what can you do that nobody else can do? And that was her claim to fame. But I couldn't think how to use it. But remember this, she would remember. OK, so we put this aside for a moment. So I have a feisty little Cinderella. And so we all decide, what's it like to be Cinderella? And she said, well, I don't have a father and I hate my wicked stepmother. So they make the story very personal. So we picked the song, the, the, and all the kids agreed their favorite music at the time was The Temptations. And so we picked the song, Daddy Was a Rolling Stone, Papa Was a Rolling Stone. And of course, it's the perfect song uh, for Cinderella to, to dance to about the lamenting of her disappearing father. Okay, they wanted to do a scene about Huff and the riot. And so we, in our story of Cinderella, we said the kingdom of Huff goes through a terrible riot. And so we picked the song, uh, one of the songs from The Temptations, uh, that was a perfect choice that was about uh, the unrest and the civil unrest that was happening. And all of the kids jump roped to it. And it was a very frenetic number and worked very well. Okay, so now we're getting ready to do the the famous moment when the prince comes, puts the slipper on Cinderella, who's in rags, and we see her then transformed into the, the brilliant princess. Okay, so we're ready to do this. I have a little boy playing the prince who has a very bad speech impediment, and he has one line in the show. He has a sibilant S sound, uh, and so we worked with him. We got a speech therapist from Cleveland State to come and help, and everybody worked with him to help. His single line was, the shoe fits. 
Okay, so S, that S sound, okay. So we work on that, work on that. And he puts the slipper on. We pick him to be the prince because once Cinderella has the slipper on, all the kids stand in front of her. We have a little boy running out with a magical dress that was made by the costumer from the Cleveland Playhouse. It was done in Velcro, so it could be put on in three seconds. They would separate and there would be our princess and they would dance to my girl. And Ricardo, even though he couldn't speak, was a wicked dancer. Okay, so we have this all in place. Okay, so the day we're going to do this, suddenly all these television stations start calling saying, we're going to come to cover this. And I keep saying, but these are little children and they've never been on the stage before and we're doing this for their mothers. You know, we're, th this is not a public event. And they went, oh, no, no, we're coming. And Dorothy Fulltime came. So all three cameras, are, all three stations are there. All their cameras are on the stage. The kids are terrified. Uh, Dorothy Fulltime sitting in the front row. The mayor calls and says, uh, we're coming with all of the city council. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> so everybody comes. All of the mothers flirt with the mayor because he's exceedingly <laughs> handsome. <laughs> so we finally get the show to start. And uh, we get through the whole first part. We get to the point where Ricardo comes out on stage with his slipper. <clears throat> we all hold our breath. <clears throat> he puts the slipper on. Uh, all, the, all the kids run in front of Cinderella. He puts the slipper on and he says, the shoe fits. Perfect. Oh, we're so proud of it. Okay, all these kids are standing in front of Cinderella, but there's disaster backstage. The little boy who's supposed to bring out the dress is so terrified by all the cameras on stage that he hides under the dress backstage. Okay, so everybody is frozen on stage now. Carl Stokes looks at me and says, what the hell's going on? Do something, do something. And so in any case, I nod to Ricardo and he says the line again. I was thinking maybe the kids didn't hear it. And he says, the shoe fits. Now take off your clothes. <laughs> so, the mothers go wild, pounding, saying, that's the kind of prince we like. So, so now there's chaos in the space, right? So the kids run away, and there is our Cinderella in her underwear, in her high heels. And so she, being very smart, uh, kicks off her heels and dances on her toes, and it brings the house down. Uh, okay, so the next day, Dorothy Fulltime writes, uh, does this commentary on the news saying, there is this brilliant young director who came up with this brilliant ending, and it was a mistake, uh, this brilliant ending, uh, and we have a Cinderella who doesn't need a ball gown, who has her own resources and dazzles us by dancing on her toes. I wrote Miss Fulltime a letter and I said, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat>